shooting can be used to describe tragic events in Colorado, Las Vegas, and El Paso. Unfortunately, the term can also be used to describe one of the most horrific events in New Mexico history, the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. Police suspect they were shot during an armed robbery. The shooting happened in February of 1990, when two men entered the Las Cruces Bowl and shot seven people, some of them in the head, while stealing about $5,000 from the bowling alley's office and then setting that office on fire. Four people were killed almost immediately, including the bowling alley's mechanic, Air Force officer Stephen Turan, and his daughters, six-year-old Paula and two-year-old Valerie. We heard the sirens all morning long, sirens, 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 and well, of course, there wasn't no, you know, cell phones then, so I kept calling the bowling alley, and I was getting very nervous because they would not answer. Audrey Martinez Turan was at work when she heard about the shooting that killed her husband and two daughters. I actually drove into the parking lot, and they stopped me once I told them who that I was. Um, they sat me back in the seat, put the seat belt on me and told me that I, I knew, I, I, I knew on the drive that Stephen couldn't have made it because um, I knew that he would be a fighter, that he would fight back. Turan was taking his daughters to the bowling alley's daycare center where they were going to be watched by 12-year-old Melissa Repass and 13-year-old Amy Hauser. Hauser was also shot and killed. Repass was also shot but managed to call 911 Pass survived the deadly shooting with her mother, Stephanie Sanic, and the bowling alley's cook, Ida Holguin. At the ongoing investigation, Martinez Turan tells us she's losing hope. Yeah, I know that 30 years, it makes it a cold case, but it's not cold. It's not cold to my family. Martinez Turan tells us if police were going to solve it, they would have by now. I would like to see it investigated more. I, you know, it being close to the 30 years, if he does get any calls or anything, I'd like to see uh, us become priority. Well, you know, it was never an easy case to begin with. If you uh, remember the facts of the case, there uh, were several people shot in there, and then the suspects uh, started fire to the small office where uh, the incident happened. And so Las Cruces uh, Fire had to go in there and put out the fire first, uh, which covered up some of the evidence, unfortunately and uh, destroyed some of the evidence. Martinez Turan says regardless of the outcome, she'll always remember her family, hoping that someday she'll see justice. And just them living, just them breathing, just them being here hurts. And, and then the way they died. Stephen was, was a good man and he was an officer and he didn't, he didn't deserve that. It's been more than 25 years, and that frantic 911 call still haunts the people of Las Cruces. Two armed men walked into a bowling alley on February 10, 1990. They shot seven people, killing four among the dead girls, ages 2, 6, and 13. Police have not been able to solve the case, and the cold-blooded killers could still be out there. The 25th anniversary of the crime passed a month ago. ABC 7's Josie Ortegon is live from our New Mexico mobile newsroom with a new development police hope will bring them new clues Rick, to investigate. Now Crime Stoppers is boosting the reward and the information is now being publicized in Las Cruces, including on the rotating electronic billboard just behind me here. Now here's a closer look at that information. The victim's pictures are included on there as well, offering the now $25,000 reward. Crime Stoppers and Las Cruces police are trying to find information that leads to an arrest in the Bowling Alley massacre that happened February 10th, 1990. Four people were killed, three of them children. Las Cruces police spokesman Dan Trujillo says for a long time, the reward was only $1,000. The local Las Cruces Doniana Crime Stoppers chapter voted to up that reward to $25,000. It seemed like forever, really, but it was, I think, just like 12 minutes. I don't know. I guess they got anxious or I don't know what happened, but then they started shooting us on the head, and I thought I had, I thought my head exploded. Ida Holguin is one of only three survivors. Oh, God, it was awful. I, um, 
I was so scared. She wasn't supposed to be there, but a new schedule at work changed her life forever. I remember it every day. I live with it every day because I was there. I was in the office. I also got shot on the head, the shoulder, and the arm. It was February 10th, 1990, around 8 o'clock in the morning, when police officers were dispatched to what was then known as Las Cruces Bowl. They shot me five times. Okay. The When officers arrived at the bowling alley, they found three people already dead. 13-year-old Amy Hauser was scheduled to work at the facility's daycare. Her co-worker, 26-year-old Steven Teran, who just arrived at the bowling alley with his two daughters, 6-year-old Paula Holguin and 2-year-old Valerie Teran, who later died at a local hospital. We didn't just lose a person, we lost the whole branch of our family tree. Anthony Teran was at school when he learned about his brother's murder. My parents were devastated. My brother had just graduated. He had put in his two-week notice at the bowling alley. He was, uh, he had a great career in the army. He was uh, looking forward to working with the police or the border patrol. My nieces were starting to go to school, starting to learn how to live life. I mean, it, just, it took away everything. Investigators say the two suspects forced each of the seven victims inside an office where they were all shot execution style. The men then intentionally set fire to the room and fled with an estimated $5,000. We still need closure. These people are still out there. I mean, this is how they lived and walk among us out here. It's still there. I mean, I think of it from when I wake up to when I go to sleep. Her nightmare began February 10th, 1990. That morning, she headed to her job as a cook at Las Cruces Bowl in Las Cruces, New Mexico. 12-year-old Melissa, whose grandfather owned the bowling alley, spent her days running around the lanes with a friend. Her mother ran the popular business. I know we're hungry. Please make us some enchiladas. I love your green enchiladas. Well, sweetie, I'm really busy right now. I mean, look at it. We've set up for all those people that are coming for the tournament. Do you know what? I'll make something for you later, okay? I promise. Let's get candy then. <laughs> Gummy bears. That morning, Melissa's and Ida's world would change forever. <laughs> Two men came in and took my carefree childhood away from me. I felt something on the side and I looked down, it was a gun. And he told me, come with me. This is the holdup. They pulled their guns out and they told me to go back to where I came from. And I did. Mama, hold on a minute. And that was an office where my mom was doing the daily deposit. Is that it? And they told us all to get on the floor, put our heads down. <laughs> the robbers had what they came for, all of the bowling alley's money. And that's what makes what happened next so unexplainable. We had our heads down. And I remember picking it up twice because I, I heard noise. When they shot me in the head, I thought my head exploded. It was so loud. I really thought my head exploded. And I don't know why, but I put my hands on my head. And I think that's what saved my life. The bullets just skimmed my head. They didn't penetrate. There would be even more unexplainable violence to come. At 8 a.m. that morning, the alley's mechanic, Steve Turan, showed up for work. Hi, Stephanie. He had his two young daughters with him, six-year-old Paula and two-year-old Valerie. Ida. He had no idea what they were walking into. God. I didn't know who was alive or not. All I knew was I was bleeding and I needed help. As the robbers fled with their take of $5,000, Melissa painfully hoisted herself up to a desk and called 911. 
Please come to Las Cruces Bowl. Please help, please. How many people are hurt? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven people are hurt? Yes, I think. <laughs> the wound in my head. It hurts. Melissa's phone call saved her own life, her mother's, and Ida's. But nothing could be done to save Steve and his daughters and Melissa's 13-year-old friend, Amy Hauser. Why the kids? Us, well, I mean, we didn't do nothing to them either. We didn't do nothing. But the kids? Melissa and Ida helped police create composites of the suspects. But over the past 20 years, no names have been attached to the faces. Faces that Melissa and Ida will never forget.
Las Cruces Police Department. Even nearly two decades later, the Bowling Alley Massacre remains the 800-pound gorilla of cold cases. I mean, we had had some homicides and um, some violent crime, but nothing to the magnitude of the Bowling Alley, and it really was pretty devastating. Mike Myers has been working the case for the past eight years, a hand-me-down from detectives who since retired. It has become a very personal hand me down. We do this job because we want to solve these exact types of crimes. And when you have such a heinous crime, you know, the desire to get to the bottom of that and solve that and bring some sort of closure to the families is immense. And to not be able to do that, it's very stressful and very uh, damaging to your psyche. So far, none of the hundreds of leads Myers and the detectives before him have followed have panned out. But he remains hopeful that someone will see this story or an FBI wanted poster and call in the tip that cracks the case. Ida Holguin hopes it's sooner rather than later. That would be a good Christmas that we would never forget. And I wish they would tell us something before Christmas. says this documentary doesn't hold back. It includes crime scene video and the terrifying 911 call by a 12-year-old girl. The purpose is to find the killers. There it is on the big screen. The call to 911 by a terrified 12-year-old Melissa Repass still brings chills. More than 20 years after two killers stormed his Las Cruces Bowl and shot seven people as they were getting ready for a birthday party. Four people died. 26-year-old Stephen Tehran, his daughter's six-year-old Paula and two-year-old Valerie, and 13-year-old Amy Hauser. Repass, her mother Stephanie Sinak, and Ida Olguin survived. The savage murders have stuck with filmmaker Charlie Min for years. I found out about the brutal crime back in 1990 when I was watching Unsolved Mysteries. I was a college student in Boston, and I was extremely angered and saddened by the, the degree of unfairness and the barbaric nature of how children were executed. Min's hope with his new film, A Nightmare in Las Cruces, is for fresh leads to come in, possibly one that will break the case. Perhaps after 20 years, people have had a change of loyalty and a change of heart, and will step, step up to the plate and say, you know something, this was so wrong. This needs to be solved. Sketches of the two killers have circulated for years, but to no avail. Min includes crime scene video in his film. He says it's important that people know how gruesome the murders were. What this film does is it gives the crime a heartbeat. It keeps it alive and fresh so new leads can come in. Min invites questions from the audience during screenings to spread the word about his cause. I'm really glad to bring it back to New Mexico's largest city to see if somebody may know something. Two gunmen shot seven people in the head. They called it the Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. And what you fear the most... Are these kind of brutal murderers wandering the streets and we just didn't know it? Is real. We had the pressure of trying to get answers to what had happened. The different variations of the stories made it really difficult to, to pinpoint on one specific area. These people had actually been executed. Somehow cocaine and cocaine funding was involved in it. That's totally made up by the press. Based on actual unsolved events. We're pleading for assistance from the public. Someone out there has the key to help us solve this thing. There's someone else besides these two people that know what happened. I hope he sees her eyes every day. I hope that that's what he remembers when he wakes up in the morning. A nightmare in Las Cruces. Nobody should lose their family this way. I believe that it was the devil. The victims. Stephanie Sanak, age 43 at the time of the shooting. Stephanie was born on November 7, 1955 in New Orleans, Louisiana. Growing up in a military family, she moved around a lot at a very young age. In 1982, Stephanie moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where she became the daytime manager of Las Cruces Bowl, a family-owned and operated company. On February 10th of 1990, her life was forever changed as a result of the shootings. She was never the same after that. Suffering from extreme head injuries, she moved away from Las Cruces in August of 1994. She moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico in September of 1998. 
Sadly, she passed away on Friday, August 13, 1999. Amy Hauser, age 13. Amy was a loving, caring, and smart girl who had her whole life ahead of her. Amy loved to shop, dance, and sing. At age two, Amy could read, and at age five, she was already in competitions in El Paso for reading and poetry. Described by many as outgoing and funny, Amy had an inseparable bond with her mom, Gloria. Amy had an extremely bright future, and her loss is devastating to her family. Stephen Turan, age 26 at the time of the shooting, Stephen was the oldest of five. He was a role model to many, and he loved his country and felt a duty to serve since he was a teen. He became a leader in his National Guard Armory in Alamo Gordo, North New Mexico, and he was up for captain when he was killed. Before his death, he was preparing his troops to go to Iraq for air defense. Stephen inspired many people. And um, he was work. He had graduated from New Mexico State University with a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice. He was looking forward to working with the Border Patrol or the Las Cruces Police Department. He put in his two-week notice to the bowling alley and had about three days left when he was killed. So sad. So sad. It looked like he had a lot going for him at the time. It's so sad that he had to lose his life. Honor and remembrance for those who lost their lives here at the Ten Pin Bowling Alley, bringing out the community of Las Cruces, making sure the story isn't forgotten. Grace, how sweet the sound. That was the worst day of my life, all of our lives, I'm sure. You, you begin to die once you start to forget the things that matter. Quoting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Anthony Theron and his family remember his brother and two nieces who were killed 30 years ago in the Las Cruces bowling massacre, explaining that after three decades, the family is still looking for justice. We're still angry. The family's still angry that there, that there hasn't been justice. Um, there were seven people that were rounded up, brutally shot, four, four were executed. And, you know, three of them were kids. Uh, I mean, how much worse can it get than that? The Theron family telling me they just want closure. It's always a hard time uh, when this time of year rolls around, especially uh, knowing that it's still open, it's still out there, you know, and, and we, of course, uh, would like to see closure at some time. And uh, as they say, to let them rest in peace and let us rest in peace and know exactly what happened and why. Audrey Theron, who lost her husband and two daughters in the massacre, says she knows she'll get her answers when she meets her babies again. After 30 years, um, I kind of feel like the Lord's going to give me my answer on the day I, on the day that I meet him in heaven. He'll give me my answer. The loved ones telling us if they had one thing they could say to the ones they lost, it would be that they're not forgotten. We still love you very much. And we're still in our hearts, and it will, will be forever, you know. Hopefully we'll meet them up, uh, up in the clouds one of those days. Owner Ron Senak, now 75 and living in Mississippi, says he was golfing in Arizona that deadly February morning. I would go to the police station every morning and ask him, what's the latest, what's the deal? Every morning I stopped there. Every day. But speculation swirled against him. The people are going to believe what they want to believe. And there's nothing I can say that's going to change your mind. Someone wanted to send a message to them. I used to say it was drug related. My heart goes out to the family and friends of the victims of this tragic massacre. I pray that one day 
that they will see they will receive resolution and justice and that one day they can feel some kind of closure once these evil evil people have been brought to justice thank you so much for watching <laughs>